a premium Chrome extension performance. So, uh, so you guys know what you're getting into. Uh, first, I'm give you guys a background of what Chrome extension performance is and talk about our goal as a team, what we're trying to work on and reach. And then sort of dive into the problem areas of extensions and where performance issues tend to rise. And finally, end on some improvements that we've done in the past that are working on, but also just a brainstorm with all of you to see what we could do to improve the performance. Uh, so some background. Uh, extension performance has for a while been a hot button topic. Um, they have the potential to really interfere with the user experience on a page. So just to give you a contrast, when you visit a bad website um, and it's doing, doing uh, poorly, you can always close a tab um, and from then on you're unaffected. However, when you, once you install an extension, it has this very long lasting effect and the user might not know what's happening. And there are a few reasons for why it is. Um, three things particularly, there are content scripts, background pages, and just inherent properties of extensions that can make things, this quite difficult. Um, so for those who don't know, a content script is essentially when the extension injects a script on a web page. So if you have adblock, whenever you visit a new web page, adblock will inject a script. This is called the content script. And you can imagine this can have several uh, significant costs. Uh, to contrast, there's persistent background pages. So this is a script that's just always present. It's running in the background. Um, and it's doing stuff. And if it's doing stuff inefficiently, then the user will face a cost. Uh, finally, there are sort of two properties of extensions that come into play when it comes to performance. One is that um, extensions can kind of be invisible. They're always designed to run in the background. Um, the user never has to really interact with it for it to take an effect. And this has a good user experience uh, gain. You don't want the user to always think about their extension. However, it makes it difficult for the user to recognize that there's a problem happening. Um, since the extension is really never visible to the user, the user might think it's the web page or at worst it's actually Chrome's fault when it's really the extension. And then secondly, there's this omnipresent uh, feature of extensions. Extensions can have very broad permissions, for example, access to all URLs, read all of your data. Um, and that means once you install a bad extension, you're sort of like out of luck. Uh, you can't close a tab in this case, and you might not even know to uninstall it. So uh, given this, there's sort of goals that we have as a team to uh, help this to mitigate this problem. Uh, so there are three parties involved. One is Chrome, the extension developer, and then their end users. So on the Chrome side, what we really want to do is just optimize and um, just really fine tune things. And then secondly is to throttle any misbehaving extensions. And is there anything we can do um, beforehand? And finally, as a team, to just track performance metrics and define them. This what we can do, and maybe even service these metrics to ex external developers. Um, so for goals for developers, what we really want to do is be able to uh, help them do the right thing, help them uh, write performance extensions, but also when performance issues are happening, be able to service it to them so they know. And finally, we have end users. So these are the people who are using the extension, they're browsing on Chrome, and we want to be able to service performance issues so they can, they have the option that they make an informed decision to disable the extension or uninstall it when they realize it's not doing well. Uh, so these goals are sort of uh, in uh, sort of fighting against these sort of problem areas that we have in Chrome. And these are three areas where uh, uh, extension execution is done and where we can find problems with the extension performance. And this is the extension render process, extensions triggered in the browser process, and extension interaction with other renderers. And the objective of this is really to see uh, what percentage of work in the process can be attributed to the extension. And in an ideal scenario, we'll be measuring things like process resource consumption, so like the CPU time or the memory that this process takes, um, and catching inefficiencies there. But this kind of tracing sounds really simple in theory, but in practice, it's actually quite um, difficult. And so I'm going to go into that right now, starting with uh, extension renderer processes. So the extension renderer is essentially uh, devoted to just extension content. So an example of this would be like an extension pop-up when you click on a badge or the background page or extension content tabs. And this is essentially just work done by extension. And it's simple to attribute work because the extension content is the only thing that's taking this renderer process. Um, there is a slight complication that extensions can share processes. Uh, and so looking at sheer process consumption alone might not be enough, but this is the simplest of all three cases. So moving on to the second one, uh, the browser process. So 
So this is uh, where extensions trigger actions in the browser process. And this is a little bit more difficult to determine uh, the actual work of the extension in the browser process. And just to give you an example, say you have this uh, two lines of code in a background page. It's a simple for loop that's uh, making this very expensive operation. So how this actually works uh, is that on job subscribe, uh, the extension will eventually call into the render, and there's something called the bindings. It's lightweight that converts the API call that you see into something in C++, which then calls the IPC in the browser. This the bulk of the work is actually being done by the browser. And so the render actually does little work in this case. So even though uh, uh, this is happening, there are some uh, positives in that. We know which render and which extension called this API, but it's difficult to actually map this to consume resources on the browser side. Finally, we have uh, extension interaction and other renderers. So, this is where the extension uh, triggers actions in other renderers, so like a web page. Um, the content script might inject a, a script that uh, affects the web page in some way. In this case, it's the most difficult to determine how an extension affects render's performance. You might think, uh, is it the content script? Which part of it is causing the bottleneck? Uh, is it really the extension's fault, or is it some API that uh, has an efficiency in Chrome? And there are some methods that we've sort of brainstormed uh, to sort of work around this. Uh, there are two. One is called taint tracking and measuring the cost of a single V8 context. I'm just going to go into these a little bit. Uh, so taint tracking, the idea is uh, if an extension injects a script tag into the main world, what if we could actually track that script tag um, and do this for any sort of script tag uh, that's there? Then evaluate the cost over on uh, going forward. However, there are some obvious uh, cons to this. Um, the script tag can have some sort of transitive effect. So it can consistently inject more scripts and so forth and do more um, manipulations to the DOM that becomes difficult to track over time. Uh, but this one, we would get perfect attribution. We would know exactly the, the extension, is what part uh, is the one that's actually causing the problem in the main world. Alternatively, um, which is slightly more plausible, is to just measure the cost of each V8 context. So content scripts run in their own isolated world. And what if we could just measure uh, the performance in one via context versus the one in the main world? Uh, this isn't perfect uh, attribution for two limitations. Once, uh, the first is once an extension injects a, con a script tag into the main world, that script is already running in the V8 context of the main world. So we sort of then lose uh, insight into what's happening. And secondly, uh, we don't account for the effect of a script tag. So say a script uh, that injects uh, some expensive CSS rules happening. Um, it's hard to sort of see what, what is the after effect of that. Is the CSS doing some expensive paint or some calculation? Um, these are sort of hidden unless we do more uh, expensive taint, uh, more advanced taint tracking. So there are some alternative, uh, some ways that we can improve this. This isn't, uh, this is going to have a happy ending. And there's sort of two categories. Uh, we can improve performance in the extension platform, and then improve uh, performance of individual extensions and other third-party code. So the first and uh, seemingly straightforward thing is just to rewrite inefficient areas of Chrome. And the most straightforward thing is to really dive through and meticulously like most teams do, uh, comb through the code and see where their performance inefficiency is. Things that are actively being done um, is rewriting the extension binding system natively. So our binding system, I sort of alluded to earlier, uh, is the one that creates the JavaScript endpoints uh, that you eventually call. Those endpoints right now uh, is, are being generated in JavaScript. And so the hope would be to write that natively and there's active work being <coughs> done there. And that would be much faster uh, than doing the JavaScript, obviously. Uh, a, a project that's sort of closed, uh, completed, is caching extension ID hashes. So an extension has a unique ID. Um, and prior to this, those hashes would have to be calculated each time. Um, and instead, now, we cache those extensions at initialization time. Uh, and that saves 
start from the browser process and the context in the renderer. And so this really avoids duplicating calculations. I mentioned uh, earlier to define performance metrics that we can track regularly to define what's a successful and unsuccessful extension with regards to performance. Uh, so the third last thing would be to better attribute work done by the extension and catch performance issues. And these fall under the three areas that I talked about before, and I'm going to go into these a little bit more deeply. Okay, so uh, for the renderer, uh, the extension renderer process. So if the extension renderer uh, is misbehaving, it's causing performance to suffer, we have a lot of control. There's a lot of things we can do. Uh, we can throttle a certain renderer process. We could uh, restrict the amount of CPU it comes, CPU or memory it consumes. We can throttle a specific background page. Um, for browser processes, it's a little bit uh, more difficult to identify the exact cost of an API uh, in the browser, but there are some heuristics that we could use. So if we find out that an extension is calling a very expensive API, frequently we could throttle it. Um, and we can also uh, track the time uh, an extension causes a browser to spend. Um, and this, again, is only a heuristic. So if the extension requires some sort of uh, user action, like a click, that would take more time. Uh, the last thing is extension interactions and other renderers. So I mentioned this before, but tracking performance of a single V8 context um, is an option. Uh, another thing we've been brainstorming is limiting uh, script tag injection. So right now, extensions can uh, interact with the DOM, uh, inject scripts as they like, but what if we limited that? So in the extreme case, we could say no script injection at all. And the benefit of that uh, is that you can then look at a single V8 context and attribute all the work to it. However, there are a lot of extensions that depend on uh, script injection, and we would be breaking a lot of use cases when doing that. So a one middle ground we can do is still limit the script injection, but extensions would have to follow a specific kind of flow, uh, a permissions, uh, either new permissions or a new API that they would have to follow. And at least this gives us a sense of more insight into what the extension could be doing. Um, but again, this is just an idea. So uh, second, I talked uh, just about the uh, <coughs> things we can do to improve the extensions platform on Chrome side. But these are things we can do for individual extensions. Um, one is just migrate the extension system just away from easily damaging APIs, um, deprecate them, uh, or either just improve them. Or se and secondly, the other thing would be just to help developers do the right thing, um, either through documentation um, evangelism. Uh, two areas we're sort of working on is moving service workers uh, to extensions. And the great thing about service workers is that uh, they're an open standard. So when they get better, the extensions platform also gets better. Uh, and then there's also the declarative web request API. Uh, and just to get into the details, so imagine uh, you say, on this web page, do this. So you visit example.com, you make a certain request. Um, Right now, this is held, handled by an older API that uh, requires you to use a JavaScript engine. And so instead of what if this, uh, this request handling can be done on Chrome side, and that could be potentially faster. Uh, finally, uh, if we discover that API is slow and it can't be con improved, um, there's sort of some sort of restrictions that we can put. Uh, we can require that the API is only called for user action. So maybe a button click on the browser uh, icon, um, extension icon. Or we can sort of limit the number of times it could be called in a specific period. Again, ideas, uh, not necessarily things we put into action yet. So if you recall, there's sort of three people or three parties involved in this. There's Chrome, there's the extension developer, and there's finally the end users. And so we want to uh, also empower users to be able to make informed decisions when uh, they know that an extension is not performing uh, well. So things that we could do is that uh, we could signal to the user that uh, the extension is slowing Chrome down. We can either use a warning bubble, um, like you might have seen on the right-hand side. Uh, we could have it suggest to disable an extension. Or during install time, we can sort of make a note uh, to caution you that this extension might take uh, more time than you think it would. 
um, so you prevent from installing it entirely. A faster presentation than I thought it would be. But if you have any questions, um, you can reach out to Chrome Extensions team at google.com. Uh, I just have members of the team that are working on civic projects more deeply and might be able to answer questions that you may have. Hello, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since we have time to figure out the question, um, are we concerned about attributing uh, like resource consumption of like ad block style extensions, which might be incredibly intensive, like running a giant pile of regexes across every network request that's going to be made, but in turn are then preventing the user from running all sorts of ad script. And like it might be 5% of all CPU time of this page, but if it weren't running, there would be an additional 10%. Like, how yeah. I guess adblock is a, it's still a trickier case, but there are some cases where adblock actually makes it faster. Mm -hmm. So like just by removing um, DOM elements. So it's still, like those are something we definitely talk about. <coughs> yeah. Do you guys have any data on like the distribution of how different extensions out in the wild, how they use the various APIs? Like let's say if I have a rough idea which APIs are expensive, which ones are trivial, do you have any data showing globally? Like how do extensions use different APIs? Yeah, ideally, um, I guess somehow weigh that by how many users install those extensions. So we do have data on uh, if some APIs are called more than others, but if your question is more like the time that an API, uh, that API call would cost, uh, not that, not that. It's just kind of as a frequency counter of like a, how often is an API used times the number by the number of extension times the users of that extension. So then you can get a sense of globally how the API. I get sorry. Maybe I should rephrase my question. I was wondering, you with that sort of data, would you consider kind of actually reducing the API exposure of the extension API so that uh, to also shrink the problem space that you're trying to solve? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think we only have data. I'm not sure, um, mm -hmm. but that's something we would look into. Yeah. We do have some data on <clears throat> how long extension data calls take in browser process. You can find that in the, the tank dashboard, assuming that it isn't a highly sort of case in this. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, I understand that permanently running background pages is discouraged. Is there any plan to sort of um, make that more visible in the UI so that extension authors will actually start stopping using permanently running background pages? Yeah, so it's uh, it's a push and pull because the amount of a regular user, not, not us, who would care about the information, and if we surface that almost too frequently, it could be annoying. Um, but it's something we talk about, and if there is something that we could do, that's a nice middle ground, maybe in the Chrome settings, Chrome extensions page, to put that information. Um, yeah. What's the relationship between extensions that like run long running background renderers and the tab slash render lifecycle stuff that we had a session about yesterday? Like, can long running extension background renderers be suspended and then discarded if we're in a memory pressure situation? Like, how does that work? Uh, I, so for me, I'm not sure, but I think that I missed that session. I think that'd be, that's a great idea to do something like that, yeah. I think the question is mostly just how to prevent could that being a sort of predictability problem that right. you make the extension right. stop. You can't, you can't just make the extension stop doing what the extension does. Right, and like, how do you indicate that you want the extension to resume? Because the user can't just like foreground the tab corresponding to that renderer process. So how do you bring it back? But I mean, yeah. we already have UX for extensions that crash, right? I guess that's this extension is crash. True. I mean, it's not great, but like, it's not. It's there's some precedent, right? Yeah, so, that's that's true. I forgot about those notifications. I guess the harder part is that, that you don't know when the extension is in the background. Because the extension is always in the background. So when right. does it switch from the active to passive state? Right, you don't have that. <laughs> yeah. 
I was curious, so you mentioned that the extension bindings are being rewritten using native mm -hmm. code, so mm -hmm. what does that look like? I assume it's not using the link bindings? Because I think no, it's like using uh, V8 bindings. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but um, I can show you a doc if you're okay. interested. Yeah. yeah, I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, okay. here's a doc. Yes. What's the current Vada extension for Google? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, something we're still thinking about, um, yeah. What are the main sort of concerns at the moment? I'm new to Chrome, so I uh, start the context. Yeah, I think we should talk offline about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's an example of like an expensive API uh, that takes up time in the browser process? Because I'm wondering, like, instead of just throttling these APIs, like, can we just make them always slow? Like, is there anything that, like, can we just say, like, oh, this API is going to run in the background kind of slowly when the browser process has time? Or is there any, like, API that you really, the browser process really should be doing when it's called immediately? Yeah, I think that um, there's definitely, like, work we can do with, around, with regards to just getting, gathering metrics around APIs. Um, I think we maybe deprioritize that, but I guess we can look into it, yeah. And is, are there any APIs that not only take up time in browser processes, but they also kind of spread to render processes? Like, I think maybe, like, for example, like, if there's APIs for, like, font settings, and if, if the, the extension changes font settings, it, like, tells the browser process, and the browser process tells all the renders, like, change your font settings, uh, have you seen APIs like that that also kind of might make all the render process do work, or is that yeah. not a rare case? I mean, I'm sure there are, but I, the matter is, is it worth, um, I guess, hold and pushing back on them? Like, it might just, if there are so few, I mean, that, that extension, that API isn't called that often, um, isn't used that often, it's not necessarily right. worth investigating it, but if it is one that is pervasive, then yeah. And it's, can you give us some basic information on uh, what extensions usually people use and how many? And when I say what extensions, I mean what, what types? Or is it, does it vary so much that we have no clear picture? Yeah, uh, I think the most I can give you is anecdotal um, information. Uh, like, there are obviously like there are power users and there are um, just like users. So, I don't know if you know this, but like on my, uh, like in the, in the can you actually you can't see that? Never mind. Um, the number of extensions that people have, but the most it strongly varies. Like we have data on what the distribution looks like, um, but uh, I'm not sure. That's not information I can easily share right now. Um, but I can talk to you offline about that. Yeah, and you have how many? You have a lot of extensions installed. <laughs> a lot of extensions installed. Your <laughs> well, you can't see it. Uh, I think I have maybe ten. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you.